Well, let's look once again to the Word in 2 Kings chapter 6. My text is taken from verse 1 down to verse 7. And I've entitled this, Lost and Found. We just read in John 9 about a man that was blind, and the Lord found him and opened his eyes. And worked that not only miracle of eyes to see him, but a work of grace in the heart. And that's what it takes. As sinners born in this world, we're born lost without eyes to see. And it takes the Lord finding us. And here in 2 Kings chapter 6, it's an unusual illustration that we have here of an axe head that one was using to cut down wood and it fell into the water. Well, that's a picture of what it is to be lost. It fell in and lost means there's no way back. There's no way of recovering ourselves. Just like this axe head. It had no strength in itself. It had no power in itself to rise up. But we have a picture of Elisha here, who's called the man of God. And he cuts down a stick, that would be a part of a live tree, cut it down and cast it into the water. And it says the iron did swim. If I was to ask somebody, well, can iron swim? He say, no. I mean, once it's fallen into the water, that's it without somebody retrieving it. I think about what the Lord showed to Ezekiel in the Valley of Dead Bones, when he showed him all those dead bones. And he was asked, well, can these bones live? The only answer that Ezekiel could give was, Lord, thou knowest. So here's an unusual story. And this is not a common everyday thing that you read about. But at the same time, it shows us as Elisha represents the Lord Jesus Christ, the power of Elisha, the power that's in the Lord Jesus Christ to exercise his will and accomplish what is contrary to nature, and that is metal floating, steel floating. And yet, here in this example, we see that taking place, making the iron to swim, doing what is against nature and using it for the glory of God, just like Christ did in healing the sick and raising the dead. A very clear picture of this power and spirit of Christ that would have been in Elisha, manifesting the power of God when all appeared hopeless for the encouraging and strengthening of the prophets. But let's let's read this here in 2 Kings 6, beginning with verse 1. And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold, now the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Not enough room. The Lord was purposing that this number of prophets that he was raising up, the place where they had first begun now was too small. They said, Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take hence every man a beam, and let us make us a place there where we may dwell. And Elisha said, he answered, Go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them, and when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. It's like anything we have. It's, it's borrowed. It's not ours. It's only ours as the Lord gives it to us. And the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. And the man said, Where fell it, the man of God? Where fell it? And he showed him the place. And he cut down a stick and cast it in thither, and the iron did swim Therefore said he, take it up to thee. And he put out his hand and took it. What a beautiful story that we see here, as I said, of just how God is able and 
does work against nature. You stop and think about what it is to raise a dead soul. It's dead. And it's not anything that man can contribute in. And yet, when God's pleased to raise a soul, he works against the nature of death and gives life where before there was death. And so, several things to observe here. Concerning the sons of the prophets, we can see here where the Lord was blessing, whereby in Elijah's day, you know, he was found under that juniper tree and complaining that they were killing off all the prophets and he alone had not bowed the knee to Baal. And the Lord reminded him that he had 7,000 reserved who had not bowed the knee. And at that time, he was not aware of what God would be pleased to do, even in the face of opposition with Jezebel and her school of prophets. She had over 200 that she fed at her table. And yet, what is that to the Lord? Here he was raising up among these a whole army and would be pleased to use them for his purposes in that day under the, under the headship of Elisha. And I think of how, again, Elisha represents our Lord Jesus Christ. He has that church that the Father has given him. And he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But here we find these in 2 Kings 6 being under the headship of Elisha, just like we're under the headship of Christ. And yet, as with our Lord, when he was on this earth, his disciples, nor Christ, had any permanent resting place. They moved with him, and where he dwelt, they dwelt. And so we see a picture even here of them being under the tutelage of Elisha, looking to him and completely separated out from any of the idolatry or the, the religious institutions of the day. This is the way the Lord works today. He'll increase that number as he's pleased to do. And what a blessing here when that number increased to such a degree that they could no longer stay in the place. They said there in verse 1, it's too straight for us, too narrow. And that's a good thing, whenever the Lord's pleased to bless. You remember that Gehazi, one of Elisha's servants, that the Lord struck with leprosy because of his covetousness, running after Naaman the, the Syrian, and God killed him. Some might think, well, this is a very discouraging time, and yet the Lord always has his people. And he's going to see to it that that work is carried on. I was looking to see if there was another servant that the Lord raised up to replace Gehazi. It's like when Judas fell to his death that they met together that another should take Judas's place. And they actually quoted the scriptures, let another take his bishopric about that in Acts chapter 1 verse 20. The only thing I found over here was in verse 15 of 2 Kings 6. It's clear that the Lord did raise up another servant because when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, this was when the Syrians were surrounding the, the, the people of Israel and they were sore troubled by this king of Syria that when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? So it's a clear evidence that here the Lord had others that he was pleased to raise up that would minister to Elisha. And so it is with Christ and his work. We don't know who it is that he'll be pleased 
to raise up, but the Lord will always raise up men in his time to accomplish his work, to the service of Christ. Sometimes you stand alone for a while, and you preach and wonder, well, how will the Lord direct? But that's the Lord's to do. This I know, and that's what Elisha was doing. They call this the school of prophets, but it was a place of learning. And I'm confident, just like Peter said, that the Spirit of Christ was in those prophets, that their learning was concerning Christ and how Christ is the, the one who was to come, was the fulfillment of all of Scripture. That I do know. They weren't just studying different topics, but it was a time of learning concerning that one who was to come, just like Moses said, that he would raise up another prophet like unto himself, hear him, speaking of Christ. Over in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, and this is how the Lord works. It's through the preaching and teaching of Christ through the scriptures by one that the Lord himself has taught. Every once in a while I'll get a letter from somebody that's interested in what they call getting into the ministry, wanting to become a pastor, and they want to know how to do it, or where they can go to school to learn. And I've often said to them, find you a preacher who's faithful to the scriptures and faithful in pointing sinners to Christ and sit under their ministry and learn through the word of Christ that's being preached to you. If they're not preaching Christ, then they're not worth your time. They can only mislead you. And this is what Paul wrote to Timothy here in 2 Timothy 2. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit you to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. If a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. So I believe this is the way that the Lord has purposed, even though our numbers may be few. We may look around and say, well, who's the next generation that the Lord is going to be pleased to raise up? He really doesn't have to raise up the next generation. As we sit here, and I know the Lord's given me 25 years here in Shreveport, and yet here I stand alone preaching the message of Christ. It may be just for this time. And then the Lord shut it all down. We're not, we have no expectation that he necessarily has to raise up another preacher. I know a lot of congregations, when the preacher dies, they put together a, a committee and they're going to call another preacher just to keep the lights on and keep a semblance of a, a congregation going. Now, if the Lord's not in it, it's better to shut down. It'd be better to sell the building and turn the lights out unless it's going to be somebody that the Lord has raised up. But he already knows those that he's purposed to carry on his work. And he's he knows and ordains those works that should endure and others that he removes the candlestick. You stop and think about all the places where Paul went to preach in his day. In Galatia, Ephesus, Corinth. Today, there's no congregation. There came a time when the Lord removed the candlestick, and he said he would. And so we're thankful even when the Lord has raised up one, just like these that were under the leadership of Elisha, thankful that they had Elisha, and uh, that he taught them according to God's word. But also, secondly here, I note that these that the Lord uses are not men of grandeur. People, when they like to call a preacher, they want somebody that's influential and impressive. And that's what the world seeks. Here, we see their minimal means of living, a place in the wilderness that became too small. And they had no means but to go out and cut down some beams and to put up some kind of place that would serve for them to be able to stay and live. 
doesn't say here that when they saw they lacked that they sent off now for cedars and marble stones and other things of grandeur to the world. Not even our Lord was that way. He was in the world, but the world knew him not. When they said we would see of our Lord where you dwell, he said that the foxes have their holes and the, the birds their nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. We're talking about the creator of the universe, and yet he purposed to humble himself and identify with sinners that he came to save. And so, here again, rather than sitting about idle, each man went out to cut down a beam. They say many hands make light work, but such was their desire to have a place that would be to the glory of God, that in the end probably wasn't anything more than just a hut or a cottage where they could dwell and, and nurture themselves. They didn't even have wherewithal to go hire workmen, but, or even to buy tools. Here they had to borrow an ax from a neighbor. But we can see that poverty is no bar to God doing his work. I have to say that I'm blessed above measure, but I also know that over the years that the Lord has raised me up to preach the gospel, I've lived in some pretty sparse places. But I can tell you, as the Lord has taught me, that whatever state I am, there with to be content. There have been many a night I've laid on a hard floor and considered that even my being there was but a temporary dwelling for me, but those I went to preach to, that, that was their life. That's all they had. But to see them rejoicing in Christ, even with the, what little they had. I remember one place, I still have the picture, I keep it to remind me, never to complain, because it was just a stark house, mud brick house that they put me in, way out in the the remote area of the country. And when I realized there wasn't even a bed to put on, I remember taking my clothes out of my bag and laying it down and using the bag for my, my pillow. And I was there for a week. But the Lord reminded me that even there, he cares for his own. At night when it came time to eat, there's one meal a day and they served me with a tin can and some kind of porridge uh, made out of leafy green and something else in there. I just uh, thanked the Lord for it and ate it because that was it. So, but they gave what they had. But I'll tell you, when it came time to preach the word, they were attentive and they were seated. And I remember sometimes after two or three hours, I would let them know I need a, a rest. And they would say, why do you need a rest? You know, you're... <laughs> They've come in from miles around on foot, and they've come to hear the gospel. Such was the contentment that the Lord had given them. That's always stuck with me, to be content with even the least of things. Over in Hebrews chapter 13, in verse 5, we find this instruction. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, to be content with such things as the Lord gives us. I know this, we receive far more than what we deserve. And anything this side of hell is mercy. But it says here in Hebrews 13, 5, let your conversation be without covetousness. To covet is to desire something the Lord ain't given you. And be content with such things as you have. In other words, even in this story here, we're reading about these prophets, their contentment and their joy was being with Elisha. That was really their joy. And where they stayed, as long as there was some measure of comfort for them to get them out of the elements, then they were happy. For he has said in verse 5, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Sometimes you get that impression when the Lord starts taking away material things or takes away your health, other things that you become accustomed to, but none of that should change who we are knowing who Christ is. And in all that, he is caring for his own. 
So even though these were humbled by God's grace, these men, they were poor men. They had nothing that was spectacular. And yet they were the Lord's. And he manifests his presence to them. They were industrious, willing to take on pains to go and build a place. And that being separated under Christ, the same is true of, of those that he separates out to himself. People say, well, grace makes people lazy. Not in Scripture. The grace of God empowers sinners to look to Christ and believe on Christ and rest in him and do his bidding. And we can see here, coming back to my text in 2 Kings 6, when Elisha said to them, when they made the request, and again, they sought his favor, they sought his blessing in everything they did, just as those who are Christ's seek his blessing in all that, that we do. And uh, when they asked his blessing, where we, we may dwell, he answered, go ye. But you notice what they respond. One said, be content, I pray thee. They're not demanding anything of him, but go with thy servants. It's like Moses said to the Lord, do not remove us from this place unless you go up with us. And that's always been my prayer even as I stand here and preach that the pulpit's a lonely place. If you've ever tried to stand up and preach by your own flesh and strength and knowledge and wisdom, you'll fall flat. And I'm conscious of the fact that I can say or do nothing unless the Lord be pleased to go with me. And that's my constant prayer, that he go with me. And uh, here, even as he answered his servants, I will go. This is how God has purposed to bless the work of Christ that he came to this earth and accomplished is through the preaching of the gospel and his going with those that he sends forth. And he said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. And lo, I am with you wherever you go. That's a blessing. And so it was with these here. But now, as we can see, just because we are under the Lord's blessing and are strengthened by him, it doesn't mean that we're not going to fall on hard times. It doesn't mean that everything is just going to go along just smoothly. And that's where we see here, where with good intention, they borrowed an ax, and they're cutting down these beams in order to put up a, a dwelling place. And suddenly now the axe head, as it says in verse 5, not only falls to the ground, but falls into the water. You can imagine being in a situation like that where you have no options. And all of a sudden this axe head goes into the water and you're faced with a situation now that you cannot reverse. And it's in that hopeless estate. And here's where I, I know you can testify it yourself. There are many times the Lord has put us. This didn't just happen by chance. That if they had just done something differently, that something else, this would not have occurred. No. The Lord purposed all this. I've, I've read some commentary on this where the woulda, coulda, shoulda. Well, they should have secured the handle and the ax, and they should have made sure that it was sharp so they didn't have to swing it as hard against the, the beam. And, and so now, because of their negligence, they're suffering the consequences. The ax head flies off. That's how men reason, thinking that somehow they can determine what is and isn't. No, all we can say is the Lord purposed this, and, and it was to teach them. And I believe... In this, Elisha being a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, it was to teach us, as he did them, of who Christ is and the master of all. He's not only the creator of all things, but he orders all things. He's sovereign in all things. And here we see again an example of how the Lord was pleased to 
direct Elisha to retrieve this iron that sh should not have ever been found again. That's why I've entitled this Lost and Found. When that iron fell into the water, it was in a situation that was irreversible. And I think about man and Adam, when we fell in him, it put us in a irreversible situation that none could recover from it, were it not that God be pleased to deal with it in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's where we see, I believe, even more so here, a picture of the work of Christ, where it says, and the iron did swim. It didn't just rise to the top, but it was swimming, coming back to the one that was sent to fetch it, as it says in verse 7, therefore said he, take it up to thee. It wasn't even required that somehow they go out into the water and get it. This was swimming toward. Here's a dead axe head that now is alive. And you can look at it all you want to. How is it doing that? But that was the Lord. And I say that's a beautiful picture of those that are sinners, dead in sin. And yet by the power of God in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, made to swim, made to come to him. Otherwise, they would not come. Now, as I was studying this, I could not get away from what is said here because they had the old handle. The axe head fell in the water. So we don't find Elisha here just taking that old handle and trying to retrieve that axe head. Everything that's represented there is old and unable to, to act on its own. It says there that when they showed him the place, here's where you can read scripture so fast that you miss it. You say, well, where's Christ? In this? We see him in Elisha, but also we see him in the stick that was cut off of a live tree and cast into the water to cause that iron to, to swim. There wasn't any trickery here, but I believe there's a lot of symbolism the tree, a live tree, represents the Lord Jesus Christ. The cutting off represents his, his death and is, is surely a picture of the cross. That being that live tree cut off with the end result of drawing dead sinners to Christ. Christ said, and I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. All that he has purposed to say by his death. You'll remember another time where the Lord had brought the children of Israel into the desert and they were thirsty. And they brought them by the waters of Marah and they complained. And what did Moses do? He cut down a tree and cast it into the water and the water became sweet. We have examples of this. Those aren't just incidents, but they're designed to show us pictures of Christ and his death, him being the tree of life. And yet being cut off and cast into the water that is the condemnation of sinners, out of that the Lord is pleased to draw sinners to himself. Such a beautiful picture. That's what the grace of God does. You, you, there's a lot of comparisons here with that axe head. Our hearts are nothing but stony iron hearts and uh, irretrievable unless God be pleased by his grace to raise those stony hearts, to cause them to swim, cause them to come alive and to, to live unto him. And that's over in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. We have an illustration of what it is to be raised, even though dead sinners, to be raised and made alive in Christ. When it says here in verse 1 of chapter 3, Colossians, if ye then be risen with Christ. There's not talking about the final resurrection, but he's speaking of these that were risen with Christ. 
So it's talking about when he died, they died. When he rose again, they rose again. That's all those that God purposed to save in Christ. If you be of that, that number, risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. That's what God does, takes otherwise stony iron hearts that have been sunk into the, the depths of the mud of this world. And yet when the Lord is pleased to do his work, he gives them that which is against nature, that is to seek Christ, a heart to seek him. Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. He died, he was buried, he rose again and sat on high. And so, in verse 2, set your affection. It's just like this iron that swam. It was swimming in one direction, according to God's purpose, to be taken up by those who were on the shore. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. I don't read anywhere here where they took that iron and made an idol of it. No, it wasn't anything in the iron. It was in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we don't set our affection on things on earth, but on him who is seated at the right hand of God. That means the work is finished. And that's where the Spirit of God draws us. For ye are dead. We're dead to this world. When Christ died, we died. Dead to that sin and the condemnation that was ours, being made alive in Christ, and your life is hid with Christ in God. So that when Christ, who is our life, shall appear. Then shall he also appear with him in glory. You see here where that gravitational pull of the iron was downward, as is our case in our sin, but by the power of God in Christ, he raises up those that were dead in their trespasses and sins. What a glorious picture we have there of what it is to be lost and then found.